turn with me, grab a Bible, and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, uh, there are blue Bibles under the seats. You can grab one of those. It'll be on page 830 in the blue Bibles there. And about every six months or so, my wife and I, we get on a little kick of eating healthy and exercising. It happens about every six months, okay? And so the first time that it happens is around January 1st. New Year's resolutions, it's a new year. You're like, well, what are we going to do? Okay, this year we are going to exercise, we're going to be disciplined about it, and we're going to eat healthy. And so that lasts for a few weeks, maybe a month, uh, and we, we get on this kick uh, January 1st. And then the second time that it happens is usually around June. And the reason for this is it's like, Things are warming up, we're starting to go to the beach, you're starting to go in a bathing suit and go swimming, and it's like, you're like, oh man, you look in the mirror, and you're like, I'm not ready to be in a bathing suit yet, right? And so it's like, I got to lose some pounds, and so usually around summertime hits, and we start thinking, I got to start exercising, I got to start eating healthy, and so we'll kind of get on a kick once again, and try to get in shape for summer, try to get our beach bodies on, and so uh, the way that we approach this is, there are, uh, actually is a company called Beachbody, and Beachbody uh, puts together these popular DVD uh, video workouts. Uh, the most popular one is P90X. And so uh, these are videos that you can watch and exercise at home. And so we've never done P90X, but we have the DVDs for Insanity, which is a similar workout system. And so uh, every six months or so, we'll get on a kick. We're like, we're going to eat healthy, and we're going to do Insanity. And so these Insanity videos, uh, y- you're watching uh, this video instruction. And the thing that's beautiful about it is that you can just do like half of the exercises and then watch people work out and you feel like I'm like getting in shape by watching them. It's awesome. And so you don't even have to do anything. You're just standing there and you're like, yeah, I'm sweating just watching these people work out. Uh, and so we love these videos. And so we do these insanity exercises and we get on this kick and we try to get in shape. And the reason we do this uh, is uh, partly because it's like, well, exercise we know is healthy. It's good, right? It's good for us. It's, so it's not only in terms of our, our shape and our image, but, but it's also, it's, it's healthy for us. It's good for us. We know we should exercise, right? And so we try to get on a kick and, and try, to, try to do that and try to eat well and try to exercise because we know it has its benefits. We know that exercise is good. Well, God speaks to this and through scripture, God says that, yeah, exercise is good. Exercise is beneficial, but God says that there is something better than exercise, that there is something better than P90X for you. And what God says is it's something called godliness. And so let's look at this letter together. And in it, 1 Timothy, what it is, is it's the Apostle Paul. You might be confused. You might thought Timothy wrote this, but it's written to Timothy. Uh, Paul is writing to his friend and, and a guy that he has mentored named Timothy. And Timothy is in the, the city of Ephesus. And Paul is telling Timothy how to deal with the false teaching that's happening in this church in Ephesus. And so Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, here's how to handle this false teaching. 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning of verse 7. He says, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Have nothing to do with this false teaching that's going on in the church there. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For P90X is of some value, but godliness is value in all things. Holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Verse 9, this is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive. That is why we work hard at this. This is why we work out spiritually, he says. Because we have put our hope in the living God. We've put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all people and especially of those who believe. What we see here is that Paul tells Timothy that physical training, it's got some benefits. P90X has got some benefits for you. P90X, it'll help you shape your buns, right? But godliness helps shape every area of your life. Godliness has value in all things, he says. Godliness impacts every area of your life and all of your relationships. Think about it for a moment. Think about uh, how godliness can shape and impact your relationships with other people. And now what I mean by godliness is of uh, a life that is the way that God desires your life to be. A life that is Christ-like. A life that reflects the thoughts and the will and the desire 
of what God wants for your life. And what we see that most clearly is in the life of Jesus, that Jesus is God, and Jesus is the clearest picture of God's desires of what humanity ought to look like, of how we are supposed to live our lives in congruence with God's will. Christ-likeness, godliness, holiness, this life that's set apart for God. And so think about if your life, if, if you were to embody the life of Jesus in all of your relationships, what impact that would make. You see, godliness is, is important for every aspect of your life. It impacts and shapes every area of your life. Think about your marriage. If you were to, in every moment, embody the, the life of Jesus, the thoughts of Jesus, the, the words of Jesus, the heart of Jesus, if you were Christ-like, if you were godly in every moment of your marriage, the impact that it would make on your spouse, the, the way you would respond, the way you would speak, the way you would treat them. Think about the kind of neighbor you would be. Think the kind of neighbor you would be, the kinds of Jesus parties you would throw and invite your neighbors over, and the ways that you would, you would love and interact with your neighbors if you embodied Jesus and the Jesus life each and every day. Think about the, the, your, your, your relationships with your coworkers and the, way, the type of worker you would be if you embodied Jesus and the life of Jesus in, in every moment at work. If you were godly and lived a godly life in every moment of work, what kind of work ethic you would have and what kind of worker you would be. You see, nothing escapes godliness. It covers everything. And that's why Paul writes and says to Timothy, physical training, P90X, yeah, it's got some benefits, but godliness, godliness is so much better. Godliness is what we ought to strive for, this Christ-like life. And that's why this summer, as we were doing this series called Under Construction, what we're looking at is the fact that all of us are in process. All of us are in transformation. All of us are a work in progress. We are under construction. And the the fancy biblical word for it is this word sanctification. Everyone say sanctification. sanctification. Sanctification is something that starts after salvation. So When you begin a relationship with Jesus and you accept what he's done for you on the cross and you're forgiven of your sins, God places his Holy Spirit inside of you and you're saved in that moment. And then begins this work of sanctification that happens as a lifelong process of you becoming more and more holy, you becoming more and more Christ-like. And sometimes it feels like two steps forwards and one step backwards, doesn't it? Sometimes it feels like, hey, I'm a work in progress. And, 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 and sometimes it's not just this linear progression, but, but it's this process of us growing and learning and becoming more and more Christ-like, becoming more and more godly, becoming more and more transformed into the image of Christ. That is what God's desire is for our lives. But here's the question that I have for us this morning. And we're going to get to the big idea actually by the end of the message. But what I want to start off with is this question. If you're a note taker, you can write this down. It's one of the fill-ins. Is it God or is it us who does the transformation? When it comes to sanctification, when it comes to this process of becoming more and more Christ-like, is it God who does it or is it us who does the transformation? You see, one group of people might think, some, some people might think, well, obviously it's God. Right? I can't do anything to transform myself. It's all God. And so if I'm not growing, if I'm not becoming more Christ-like, if my faith isn't growing, that's God's problem, not mine. I can't do anything about it. I'm just going to wait around until God does that work in my life. Another group of people might say, no, no, it's, it's, it's all on us. Right? It's all on me. I've got to make it happen. I've just got to work harder. And if I do the right things, then I'm going to be Christ-like. Then I'm going to be more like God. So which one is it? Is it God or is it us that does the transformation? What I want us to look at together today is that question and to look at what's God's role in all of this and what's our role in this transformation? What's God's part and what's our role in this transformation? To to begin with, I want us to look at our role. What is our role? And the first thing is this, if you're taking notes, is that you can't just try to be godly. You must train. You can't just try to be godly. You must train. You can't just have the thought, hey, I want to be godly and then do nothing about it. And then all of a sudden you wake up one morning, you're like, well, I'm godly. Look what happened. You can't just try. You have to train. You got to do something about it. You have a part to play in this. So oftentimes we'll say something like, I'm going to try to grow, right? Or uh, I'm going to try to give it my best effort. And oftentimes when we say that, it's kind of half-hearted. We don't really think we're actually going to do it. 
It's kind of like when someone says to you, hey, I'm going to try to make it to your party on Friday night, right? And you, you know that that's just a polite way of saying, yeah, I'm not going to be there, right? I, you're not coming. I'm going to try. I'm try. I'll try to be there. It's kind of half-hearted. Or I'm going to try to lose weight. If it doesn't, you know, <laughs> I'm just going to try. You can't just try. You have to train. You can't just try. You have to train. Think about this with basketball. To be an NBA basketball champion, you can't just show up and try, right? Steph Curry, he didn't just show up at the NBA finals and go, I've never played basketball before, but I think I want to give it a try. And then just show up and, and just, I'm just going to try super hard and it's going to happen. I'm going to be an NBA champion. It's not how it works. You don't just try. You've got to train. And so to be an NBA all-star, you've got to train physically and, and get your fitness there. And, and you're running and you're working out. You work on your dribbling. You work on your shooting. You work on your passing. You spend hours and hours and hours training over and over and over again. Rehearsing, practicing, practicing in order to become a champion. You don't just try. You've got to train. And the same thing with us spiritually. You you don't just try. You've got to train to be godly. I saw this uh, with musicians. So it's not just with sports. With musicians, uh, I went to Pepperdine University. uh, And for two years, I was a music major. And then I changed it to a minor. And here's part of the reason why. I was a music major and I was a vocal uh, production or vocal vocalist was my major. I can't even, I don't even remember what they called it. Vocal production was what they called it. Uh, So I was a vocalist. And so uh, that was my major, and I was focusing on that. And what I discovered was that uh, I was kind of amateur status in terms of my practice. I, I, I tried to be a singer, but I wasn't training very hard. So I would do about 20, 30 minutes a day of rehearsing uh, as a, a vocalist. Now, you might think 20, 30 minutes a day, that's, that's pretty good if you do that every day, uh, you know, for a number of years. On the other hand, I had friends who were classical guitarists, I had friends who were violinists, and they would put six to eight hours a day, every single day, practicing. Their best friend was this little room that was, uh, you know, this little quiet room that they would go in, and they were six, eight hours a day playing the violin, six, eight hours a day playing the classical guitar. Now, they are currently professional musicians, and I'm talking instead of singing right now, right? (laughs) Difference was, I was trying to be a singer, but they were training to be professional musicians. You can't just try, you've got to train. And it's the same thing with us spiritually. You can't just try to be godly, you've got to train as well. Here's what trying to be godly can look like. Put on the WWJD bracelet, right? What would Jesus do? And if you have one of those, I'm not knocking that. But you put on that bracelet, and... When you're in a moment, like in the midst of your life, trying to be godly is simply in the moment going, what would Jesus do in this moment? And you're trying to conjure it up, and you're like, I'm mad at this person, and I want to punch them, but what would Jesus do? You know? And you're like, in the moment, I'm going to try. And it's like showing up at the, 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 the all-star game, and you haven't practiced yet. That's trying to be in the moment. I'm just going to be godly. I'm just going to try. I'm going to muster it up in the moment. And it doesn't work that way doesn't work that way. Spiritually, you have to train yourself. You can't just try to be like Jesus. You have to train. You've got to train for it. And the Greek word there uh, for training is gymnazo, where we get the word gymnasium from. This idea of training and exercising and working out. And Paul writes and says, you've got to train yourself to be godly. You're not just going to wake up one morning and go, wow, I'm Christ-like. It just happened. I put on the bracelet and magic, here it is. I can just try to be like Jesus today. No, you got to train. And so my question is, are you training for spiritual growth? Are you training for spiritual growth? Are you disciplined and working on this growth in your life on a daily basis? Now, I think, you know, with exercise, we come up with excuses all the time. I do. I'm the best at this, right? It's like, I would exercise, but right now it's just a busy season for us, and so I just don't have the time for it. Or like, ah, I just don't feel that good today, so I'm not going to go to the gym. I'm just not feeling good. You know, we start coming up with excuses um, for why we can't go. I'm going to start next week, right? That's the that's the best. I'm going to start tomorrow, and then tomorrow I'm going to start tomorrow. It's just like this moving target. I'm going to start tomorrow. Um, That's what exercising, eating healthy, whatever it is. And we can do the same thing with our spiritual lives as well. 
Right, we come up with excuses. Well, I can't, I can't train right now, or I can't, I can't grow right now. And then we come up with excuses, and sometimes it's blaming other people, right? It's like, hey, I would be growing right now, but just my life group leader, they just don't have it together, you know? And you start blaming, hey, if I just don't have the right life group leader. If I had the right life group leader in my life, then I'd be growing. But right now, I just don't have the right life group leader. I don't have the right mentor. Um, or it's like, it's just a busy season right now. I've got a lot going on right now. And when things settle down, then I'm going to focus on my spiritual growth. It's just a busy season right now. Or, hey, my church, my church doesn't have uh, enough programs or the right things in place in order for me to really spiritually grow in this season. And Paul says, you've got to train yourself. It's your responsibility. You've got to train yourself to be godly. You've got to train yourself for, to be Christ-like. And then there's the whole, like, well, the pastor, you can, you can blame me. I, people blame me, right? It's like, the pastor, they, they just, you know what? They're just not feeding me, right? I just don't feel fed at this church. And, and the preacher is just not feeding me enough. And I'll, I'll say, I've said that before. Um, and I'm like, you know, they're just not feeding me. And Paul says, feed yourself. It's your responsibility. It's your responsibility to train yourself to be godly. So Pastor Ken, are you saying if I just work harder at this and I get this training program going that I'm going to be godly? If I just work harder, I can just muster it up and make it happen. Well, no, not exactly. That's not exactly how it works. You know, I want to go back to that question. Whose job is this spiritual growth? Is it God or is it us who causes the transformation? Well, in one sense, it's up to you to train yourself to be godly. You have a role to play in this. You have a role to play in this. You've got to train yourself to be godly. But on the other hand, we see this second truth as well, and you can write this down. Transformation is a joint project. Transformation is a joint project between us and God. If you're thinking about your life as a, being under construction, then the construction project that God wants to do in your life, it's a joint project. It's not a solo effort. It's not something that you do on your own. It's not something that God does on his own. It's a joint project. Paul says, train yourself to be godly. So you've got to responsibility here. You've got something to do. Uh, You're not passive in this process. But in another letter, Paul writes, and I'll put it on the screen here, in Philippians 2 verse 12, he says these words, continue to work out, work out, continue to uh, work out your salvation. And with that word salvation, he's talking about this, this process of sanctification in our lives, this process of becoming more and more holy. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is who? It is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. With a play on words here, let's leave that up. Paul is saying, you work out. You work out, so you have a role to play. You are to work out because God is at work in. Okay, here's, here's this, this joint project going on that you are to work out. You have a role to play. You've got to P90X your spiritual life. You've got some training to do. You've got to work it out. There's a role that you play in it. But the only reason you can do that is because God is at work in. God is at work in you, giving you the will in order to do it. God is the one who's going to do this transformation in your life, but you've got a role to play in it, and God will work in and through that. You see... As I was talking a little bit earlier about, I want to clear this up a little bit, is that when you get saved, when you become a Christ follower, when you, you, uh, the good news, the gospel is this, that you can do nothing to save yourself. In terms of salvation, in terms of, of God saving you, you do nothing. It is completely a gift. God does it all. Jesus Christ, he does the work for you. And it's a free gift. And as you receive that forgiveness and you receive the Holy Spirit in your life, then God begins this process of sanctification. And when it comes to sanctification, we play a role in it. And when it ter- comes in, in terms of you've been saved and now you're being conformed to become more and more Christ-like and to, to be changed and transformed, you play a role and God plays a role in it. It's this joint project. But the way it works is that you're not completely passive. You do some, but you're also not fully in control. And to help us think about this, uh, there are three different kind of ways that in life we interact with control. So one is there's things that you're in control of. You can pick up a phone and make a phone call. You're in control of pressing buttons and pressing send. That's something that you can control. You can drive a car 
And you can be in control of steering and driving the car. You can be in control of what you say. There are things that you have control of in life. There's a second category of things that you have absolutely no control of. You can't control the weather. You have no control of the weather. You and I have no control of what's going to happen in Europe tomorrow or in Asia tomorrow. There are things that you have absolutely no control of. Things that you have control of, things you have absolutely no control of. But then there's a third category. There's a category of things that that we have some control of, but, but not full control over. And I want you to think about sleep for a moment. Going to sleep is something that you cannot completely control. You can't make yourself go to sleep just like you can make a phone call. Okay, it's not like... Dial some numbers, hit send, and poof, you're out, right? You sleep. It's not like you flick a switch and all of a sudden you're asleep. If, if you can do that, that's fantastic. That's, that's a miracle. It's amazing. We want that. Um, but you can't just make yourself fall asleep. But there are things that you can do that can help sleep come. So you can turn off the lights. You can lay down in a comfy bed. You can uh, make sure that the room is quiet. There are things that you can do that help sleep come, but you can't make yourself fall asleep. It just happens. God does it. Your body does it. You you, you don't control that. And that's sort of how this transformation happens in our walk with God. Let's think about it another way. Uh, Think about the difference between a motorboat and a sailboat. With a motorboat, you're in control. You have a motor that you start And you can steer where you're going, and you can control the speed, how fast or how slow you're going to go. You are in control of of where uh, this boat's going and how fast and everything with a motorboat. But think about a sailboat. A sailboat is something that you're not completely passive. You don't have no control of it. You've got to control the sail. You've got to control a rudder. But you're also at the mercy of the wind. In a sailboat, if there is no wind, you're not going anywhere, right? Right? If there's no wind, you ain't sailing. You're at the mercy of the wind. And if the wind blows, then you can do your role and you can catch that wind and you can steer that sailboat. And that's how the spiritual growth, that's how the spiritual life kind of works. You see, we need to catch the wind of the spirit. We're at the mercy of God doing transformation in our lives, but there's a role that we play in it. We're at the mercy of we can't just fall asleep, but there's things that we do that help sleep come. And you can't grow your life, but there's things that you can do that help to to set up so that God's spirit, the wind of his spirit, can blow into your life and can grow you. And so transformation is a joint project between us and God. And so what does this practically look like? How do we catch the wind of the Spirit in our lives? How do we train ourselves to be godly? What does that look like practically in our lives? And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. To train yourself to be godly, you've got to practice spiritual disciplines. To train yourself to be godly, you've got to practice spiritual disciplines. Spiritual training happens through something we call spiritual disciplines. And spiritual disciplines, these are habits. These are, are practices that we do in which... We are uh, spiritually working out. These are practices in which we do our part and say, hey, I'm going to do this. And then what it is is us putting ourselves before God and saying, God, would you work in my heart? God, would you work in my life? God, would you teach me? Would you grow me? God, would you make transformation happen in my life? But you've got to do your part. You've got to do the spiritual disciplines. You've got to do the spiritual training. And in that, when we do these spiritual disciplines, when we do these spiritual practices, what they are doing is these are trainings. These are, are kind of like for uh, uh, an athlete. These are the drills that you do over and over again so that in the game, you're not thinking about drills. You're thinking about playing the game. Let me explain that a little bit more. So in, I, I play hockey. In hockey, when you're first learning how to play hockey, you work on something called stick handling. So you got your stick, you got a puck, and you work on Doing this, right? With the puck back and forth, back and forth. This is called stick handling. So you're working on this for a while, and you get your head down, and you're looking at it, and you're trying to figure out it. And over and over, repetition, you keep working on that. And then you work on having your head up, and you'll see that someone who's played for a long time, they don't have to look at the puck. They just feel it because they've practiced over and over again stick handling. 
Now, when you're first doing it, you're going front, back, front, back. You're thinking that over and over, front, back, okay? And then over time, you're not thinking about it anymore. You've just practiced it over and over again. And so in a game situation, when you're going and, and, and you're approaching the goalie and the goalie wants to poke check you, which is they use their big stick and they try to hit the puck away from you, you have over and over again practiced so much that instinctually you move the puck away from them and you're not even thinking front, back. It's just you've practiced over and over again that in the moment you do what you've practiced over and over again. You've trained yourself. You're not just trying. You've trained yourself to respond. Or with a musician, I think about for Mitch up here leading us in worship. Now, when Mitch first started playing guitar, he was thinking C, 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 G, 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 D, D, D. I mean, he's strumming and thinking chord, 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 and how, where to put his fingers and all of that. And, and he had to practice and practice and train and train and train and train. And now when Mitch is up here, he's not thinking C, C, C. He's playing these chords, and he's singing, and he's thinking about what he's going to say next. I mean, he's, he's so trained that he's not worried about the chords anymore. They're instinctual for him. And the spiritual disciplines, these spiritual practices that we do, we practice them over and over again so that in the moment when you got your what would Jesus do bracelet on, you're not just trying in the moment, but you've been training. And instinctually you go, I'm saying what Jesus would probably say in this moment. I'm thinking what God would think in this moment. I'm, I'm aligning my life with his will because I've practiced over and over again. I've done the spiritual training. I've done these spiritual disciplines. And so for the rest of the summer, what we're wanting to do here at Beach Point Church, for the rest of the summer is to practice spiritual disciplines, to do this spiritual training. And so each week, we're going to look at one different spiritual discipline and, and practice that throughout the week. In order that by the end of the summer, we've practiced through five or six different spiritual disciplines. And my prayer is that these wouldn't just be a one-time deal. Okay, we got through the summer. We're done with training. Move on. But things that you would incorporate into your relationship with God and into the practices of your life. Let me give some examples. So one that that we're going to talk about is uh, rest and Sabbath and making room for solitude and silence in your life. Of getting away and, 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 and not doing all the time. This idea of Sabbath. And so some of you are like, hey, if a spiritual discipline is napping and not doing anything, sign me up. I'm going to be godly by the end of the summer. So, so that's one of the things we're going to look at. Another is fasting. This idea of fasting. Fasting is refraining from food or uh, maybe you're fasting from something else in your life. And this idea of fasting and, and realizing in it that God, you're what I need most, even more than food. God, you are the hunger and, and, and what I thirst for. So fasting is something we're going to do. We're going to look at worship and this practice of giving God honor and praise through your life. We're going to talk about prayer and developing the prayer life and prayerfulness in your life. We're talk about scripture reading, which is where I want to focus us today is in these last moments we have together, is of fostering in your life the discipline of spending time in God's word and in reading scripture and in spending time with him through God's word. You see, it's not enough for you just to to show up on Sundays and go, Pastor Ken, feed me. If you want to train, if you want to be godly, you've got to train. You've got to become a person who's, who's consistently in your life going, God, would you speak to me through your word? God, would you train me through your word? That's how Timothy, that's how Timothy became uh, so dynamic as a leader and, and, and how his life was so uh, godly and trained for godliness. We see this in 2 Timothy 3, this last scripture we're going to look at, 3, 15 through 17, I have it on the screen here. It says this, Paul's writing to Timothy once again, this is the second letter, and he says, from infancy, since you were little, you have known the Holy Scriptures, you've known the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then Paul writes, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and what? Oh, training, and training in righteousness, in Christ-likeness, in godliness. All scripture is useful in training you to be godly, to be righteous, to be holy, to be set apart, so that the servant of God, us, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, so that you and I are prepared in the moment. What would Jesus do? We've been trained for it. We know how to think. We know what God's word says. You see, scripture reading 
Spending time in God's word is so important if you want to be godly, if you want to be Christ-like. It's so, such an important part of your training. And so on the back of your note page, if you want to grab that note page and look on the back side of that, every week we have three journal questions that are connected with, drawn out of three scriptures. And here's what I want to encourage you to this week. This is my challenge for us as a church this week, is that we, all of us this week, would spend three times doing a personal quiet time with the Lord, opening up the Bible, and going through those three different questions. So one question, one section per day that you'd do three times this week that you would work on training yourself to be godly. Now, you might be here and you're like, hey, I already do this every day of the week. Okay, you, that's awesome. You're an all-star. Um, but for all of us, we're wanting to, to begin training. And so you don't start with 100 push-ups. You start with five push-ups and you work your way up. And so in this, it's not about the, mal- uh, it's not about the amount of scripture you consume. It's not like, okay, I, I read eight chapters today. Well, you're really godly. Then. You know, it, it's not about the amount of scripture you're consuming. But it's the amount that you're applying to your life. It's the amount that you're saying, God, would you change me and transform me through your word? God, would you uh, help me to become godly, more Christ-like, and apply what you're speaking to me through the scripture? And so that's our goal with the back of the page there, is for you to spend time not just consuming a lot of scripture, but going, what is this passage saying? What does this mean for my life? How am I going to think differently? How am I going to live differently? How am I going to become more and more Christ-like? So that in the moments of you interacting with your neighbor, you interact with your spouse, your kids, your other students at school, that in that moment, you're not just going, oh, what would Jesus do? You've trained yourself. God's already spoken and, and shaped your heart and your mind. And so will you commit to doing the scripture reading this week? And this leads us to our big idea. Big idea is this, that your transformation comes through training. That if you desire to be godly, if you desire to be Christ-like, if you desire this life that we know, if we could live like Jesus, it would impact all of our relationships in such a positive and good way. But if you desire that, that transformation, it comes through training. Now, it's not all up to you. God does the transformation. God, God's the one who will change and shape your heart. But you have your role to play, doing these spiritual disciplines, this training, and putting yourself before God and saying, would you shape me and form me? Well, as the band comes up and as we respond together in worship, I want to encourage you. Maybe you're here today and you're like, just like my wife and I, every six months, we're like, oh yeah, I should start exercising again. Uh, Maybe that's you and you're like, hey, I've done spiritual disciplines before. I, I, you know, I, I used to spend a lot of time in the word and today's a good reminder maybe for you of pressing reset and going, hey, I've kind of fallen away from that. Spiritually, I've packed on a few pounds, and I haven't been exercising, eating, eating well, but um, I want to get back in the Word. And if that's you, may this moment be a, a moment to press reset and say, hey, I want to recommit to this. Maybe for others, though, you're here and you're like, I've never really practiced spiritual disciplines before. I've never really read much of the Bible. I've never fasted. I don't really know how to pray. And my encouragement for you would, would be, would you walk in this with us? We want to walk alongside you. Would you commit this week to going, hey, I'm, I'm just going to try. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and begin to train. And I'm going to try uh, one day at a time. And out of that, begin to learn, you know, how to do five push-ups spiritually. And from that, I trust that God is going to work in you. God is going to work through you. God is going to grow you and shape you and transform you into the life that he desires for you, which is actually the life that you want for yourself. You see, it does, doesn't happen. You're not just going to wake up one morning and go, wow, I became the person that I wanted to be. Your transformation comes through training.